you want us to record on our end as well? Do you want these guys to record on this end? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Good. We'll do. Just okay, second. great. Just take a couple seconds while they get set up over there. All right. Well, we'll take a couple seconds. I'm I'm recording on my end, so we can at least uh, maybe uh, get started here a little bit, and uh, and then your team can record the the gist of what follows. Uh, I think to, I want to thank all of my uh, normal viewers for being here today. Uh, because I'm very excited. Uh, I even dressed up today. <laughs> uh, the, the guest today is somebody who needs no introduction. Uh, that is uh, His Excellency Bishop Robert Barron, Auxiliary Bishop in Los Angeles. I've known uh, Bishop Barron for a while. I wouldn't say that we're dear and close friends and old buddies from way back, uh, but we've run across each other in various conferences and so on. I'm going to mention one later. Uh, that was held at Mundelein. And I just can't thank him enough for taking the time uh, to be uh, to be with us today. This is a, a rare treat. And so thank you so much, Bishop Barron, for being here. You're quite welcome. Good to be with you, Larry. Okay. So let, let's, uh, I want to start with a very generic question. I mean, I, when I sent you the email asking you to come on here, I said I wanted to discuss evangelization and the role of beauty and, and that and so on. But before we get to that, I I'd like to ask a very simple question, which is, what prompted you all those years ago to start Word on Fire? What was your what was the the fire in your belly that caused you to take on this beast? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was um, the keen conviction that we weren't doing enough, and by we here I mean the Catholic Church that we were, you know, active in our parishes and we were uh, using maybe some of the older forms of media, but I thought there's so much more we could be doing. And I thought of our Protestant friends who were way ahead of us in most cases. I thought of Fulton Sheen, who's the pioneer, but then we kind of dropped the ball after him. And I've told yeah. the story before, but I'll tell it again. Uh, around that time, I was having lunch with an older priest friend of mine from Chicago. And I was a professor at Mundelein at the time. And, um, you know, I, I was sort of pontificating along these lines and, you know, why aren't we doing more? And there's so much, you know, we could be so much better at this. And finally, he sort of got impatient with me. He said, well, what are you doing about it? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that it, it took me aback, you know, and I, I first kind of sputtered like, well, what do you mean? I'm a professor and I write books. And he said, yeah, but that's not, you know, reaching the audience you're talking about. So that was kind of a, a, a prompt. That was a little fire in the belly, that conversation. But it was a general sense that we weren't doing enough to reach, you know, uh, the people we could reach. Well, that's fantastic. And I'm glad that you did. I have, I'm, I'm a bit of a Luddite myself. And, and so I, I am have... too, actually. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm personally not that great. At all. I, I have a team of all these young people that know how this stuff works. You know, I just provide the content. Yeah. God forbid anybody makes a mistake on any of these interviews because I just have to do it again. Cause I have no idea. I have no idea how to edit anything. And so yeah, I'm more have... or less like that too. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, Let's 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 so that that's fantastic. We're all glad that you did start Word on Fire. And I would wager that it might be the largest, the largest evangelizing sort of digital format uh, evangelizing effort in the church today. Am I wrong about that? It might be. I haven't really done all the metrics and calculations, but, yeah. uh, you know, we started very small. So the beginning of it was a 15 minute sermon show on Sunday morning at 515 yeah. a.m. That's how I began. <laughs> And yeah. I asked the people in my, uh, the good people in the parish I was serving at, uh, would you give me $50,000? I needed that to fund that year. And they did. That's how it started. And then I always tell the story that when we started uh, YouTube and I started doing these videos right when YouTube began, uh, we basically coincided with the beginning of YouTube. And I remember when Father Steve, my colleague, would say, there are 300 people watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> really 300 people watched it so i was thrilled with 300 you know back in whenever that was yeah. 2007 um so we started pretty small and it just by god's grace i think it, it just kept growing and growing and then expanding and people were drawn to it and we just tried ever newer things so let's just try, go down this path let's try this and long yeah. form documentaries the youtube videos and then you know essays and so on and it just grew and grew thank god yeah, thank God. All right, so um, evangelization. So in the church today, I mean, there are there are some who would say uh, we don't need to evangelize anymore uh, because uh, anonymous Christianity, people are already latently Christian. 
Uh, it's more a sense of fraternal cooperation and interreligious dialogue. So just a very basic question. Why evangelize? Because Jesus told us to. It's the most fundamental command he gives us. Go and, you know, preach to all nations and baptize them. So it's not an option for us. And right. I, I, as you, are part of this tradition that comes strongly out of Vatican II and uh, Paul VI and John Paul II that put a new stress on evangelization. Um, I'm a great devotee of Cardinal George of Chicago, too, and, and he was very much in that school that the church, by its very nature, evangelizes. It's a, you know, what's, what's the cliche they say? It's, a, um, it's not the church that has a mission, but a mission has a church. You know, that the mission is the englobing yeah. reality and the church is the vehicle for the mission. So I've often said every single part of the church, every aspect of it is evangelistic. I remember losing some people here in Santa Barbara who were on the board of a local high school, uh, and Catholic high school, and uh, all lay people. But we're talking about the purpose of the school, and they were talking about science and math and all these good things. And I said, well, the purpose of the school is to evangelize. And, and they all looked at me like, what? And I explained that everything in the church has as its purpose to announce Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And one of the people said, but we'd lose all our students. And, and I said, well, then good. I, why yeah. do we have a school under the Catholic aegis that is not evangelizing? Yeah, I uh, would often say that when I still work at DeSales University and this issue of Catholic identity would come up at faculty meetings. And, I, and, I would, and they would say, but if we did that, then the school would close. And I would say, good, maybe it should. Fine. Yeah, so there's fine. nothing written in stone that this place is just supposed to be an employment agency for exactly. wayward academics. <laughs> it's supposed to, have, you know, and we're both Balthazarian in a sense. And I mean, Balthazar's Christology is utterly missional. Yeah. And, 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 and he sends the, uh, as the father sent me, so I send you and all that. But also, um, I mentioned when, when you interviewed me, my spiritual director from seminary, uh, a convert from Judaism, a fellow named Father Anton Morgenroth. And I once asked him in spiritual direction, he was this, he had this sick ass, very sick accent. And he looked like a cross between Leonard Bernstein and Alfred Hitchcock. And uh, he, uh, I said to him, Father, could you encapsulate for me the gospel in just one sentence? Yes. I would say, come out of hell. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I've always, I always, I sort of wondered what he meant. I, I said, what do you mean by that? He says, because the goal of the church is not to, in a sense, keep people from going to hell someday, although there's right. that possibility. Right. It's in a sense that people are already living in a foretaste of hell so very often, and that the gospel is liberating. It's good and news. Right. Another reason to evangelize is to have people come out of hell. To alleviate the suffering of the world. Absolutely. And right, Jesus as Savior, so, um, you know, so tear in the Greek, salvator in Latin, he's the healer, the one that brings the salve. There's something sin-sick about the world, and Jesus um, heals us. And, and we can see that and feel that. When you're grafted onto Christ and you start living his life, it frees you from certain attachments. It frees you from um, your preoccupation with yourself and your ego. And that's the transformation that the Council of Trent would call an increase in justification. So we're justified, you know, in Christ, but then there's an increase in justification, which just means being set right. So we're just shifting metaphors, being healed, salved, saved, being justified, being set right, being set, you know, uh, brought back to integration. So pick your metaphor, but right, those are all uh, images for getting out of hell, if you want, because it's our disintegration that causes so much suffering. It's the sickness of sin and attachment that causes suffering. And the gospel is meant to you know, heal. Heal from that, because in, in many ways, sin is a kind of addiction. Yeah. And and it's it's a form of idolatry, in a sense, because you're replacing, uh, our, our hearts have a void. You know, I'm very Augustinian. Yeah. Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And there's a void there. That unless we fill it with God, we fill it with penultimate things, not yeah. ultimate things. And those penultimate things don't satisfy, and they lead us to a downward vortex of addictions. The Bible tells that story over and over again, it seems to me. Um, and you described it exactly correctly. If I hook my infinite desire onto something finite, uh, I might get a buzz when I achieve, you know, so it's pleasure, power, honor, whatever you're going for. But it, it'll have to wear off because Augustine was right. We're not wired for that. 
like I, I, the way a, a dog is, I mean, a dog on the beach running into the surf and running back to see his master, that dog's in heaven because every desire he's yeah. got is, is being satisfied. But we're not like that. We've got this, it's the source of all of our art and all of our, all of our uh, poetry is that we have this longing for the infinite that nothing in this world can fill. So the things of the world are good, but they're loved, as Augustine would say, for the sake of God. Love God first, and then everything else for the sake of God. That's getting it right. That's called um, conversion. So there's another metaphor. You've got healing, you've got justification. Now you've got conversion, being turned around, you know, away from creatures toward the creator, and now creatures in light of the creator. Then you're in spiritual, um, you know, good territory. And that's why evangelization, I think, also has to include a tremendous emphasis on right worship uh, yeah. because unless you're worshiping the one true God and, and, and worshiping him with beauty and joy, uh, you are going to worship lesser things. Right. Uh, it's so back it, though. Yeah. And, and so in some ways the, the life of a Christian is a kind of, uh, uh, there's a great book out by Khalid Anatolius called uh, deification through the cross. He's an Eastern Rite Catholic, and he has a whole chapter. He talks about doxological contrition, hmm. uh, that this is what Christ offers to the Father. It's very similar to C.S. Lewis's idea of the perfect penitent that he lays mm -hmm. out in mere Christianity. And that this is what we imitate in our sanctification process as well, is, is to engage in a process of doxological contrition, where I'm sorry for my sins and then convert to the proper doxology of the Lord in order not to fall back. What's the, what's the biblical story? Uh, you know, you cast out one demon and, and you don't yeah. replace it with a and seven right. or more rush in to take their place. Yeah. You know, years ago, I, I did my doctoral work on Aquinas and, and Paul Tillich. So I read a lot of Tillich years ago. And in the course of my own writing you know, career, I became very critical of Tillich in different ways. But I, I've always remembered his line, which is, all you need to know about a person you learn by asking one question, what do you worship? And I've always felt that's dead right. Uh, yeah. What is of highest value to you? That's what you worship. So everybody worships something. Uh, you got to serve somebody, as Bob Dylan said. So everyone's got an ultimate good. And that's all you need to know. If you say, yeah, my right. ultimate good is, is pleasure, it's power, it's prestige, it's even very good things like my family or my culture. Now, see, watch Jesus as he goes after even those things as they become idolatrous. You know, yeah. uh, hey, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me bury my father. Let the dead bury their dead. He's not being anti-family or, or psychologically perverse. It's a spiritual move. Is that even this very high good of your family is not the sumum bonum. And so you've got to be detached even from that. Read the Akedah story now under that rubric, you know, of, of sacrifice to me even this son of yours, Abraham, whom you love more than anything or person in the world. That's the, that's the hard edge of the biblical uh, spirituality. But it's, it hinges on worship. Um, look at yeah, Vatican yeah. II under that rubric as well, how important right praise is. Uh, it's at the heart of the church, and therefore it's at the heart of the church's mission. It, it's, it's the uh, necessary propedeutic to going out properly into the world. Now bring in another hero of mine, like Reynold Hillenbrand and, and the leaders of the liturgical movement in the 40s and 50s. Dorothy Day, you know, is part of that uh, move. Uh, they got all that. And you and I both talked about this. I, I think there's been such a falling apart since the council into the two camps of the liberals and conservatives who each have a piece of this puzzle. But the key is people like Dorothy Day and Merton and, and um, um, Reynold Hillenbrand, uh, they got it. They got the integrated piece. And yeah, something yeah. fell apart, though, after the council. Well, well, we can talk about that. I mean, uh, um, to go back to Tillich, <laughs> yeah. you mentioned, I mean, I think he called it the ultimate concern. If, yeah, if memory ultimate serves concern. Ultimate. Right. And I, I remember just a side story. I, my first class I ever taught, you know, I was fresh out of PhD and full of vinegar right yeah. and and so i gave my students a book by tillich to read these are undergraduates right? yeah and that went over like a lead balloon thud i quickly realized you can't you can't you can't do that you have to do other things uh and then later i came to also be critical of tillich because i think his correlational method ultimately yeah. undercuts that concern for proper ultimate concern but anyway well you know that, bard is what bard and tillich of course were engaged on that point because tillich begins as a neo-orthodox 
So he begins right. kind of in the camp of, of Bart, but he splits. And, and Bart's comment was, uh, yeah, the method of correlation would work great in paradise or heaven. It just doesn't work very well here because in paradise or heaven, we'd ask all the right questions. So the method is, you know, my question corresponds to an answer from God and theology brings the two together. But Bart said, look, in this fallen world with our fallen minds, we ask all the wrong questions. We ask stupid questions. And yeah. so then the answers get perverted, too. And that's one of the most trenchant critiques of, of liberalism, if you want, is we keep allowing our own questions to run the show rather than the great form. Now, there's our Balthazar, the great gestalt of Jesus, who becomes the, the norm, who changes the kind of questions I ask. That was my conversion from uh, the standard liberalism of my time when I was a, a young guy. That was a big part of my conversion, was to realize the truth of that. Yeah, there has to be a true discernment of spirits uh, and, yeah. and asking the right questions. Uh, this goes to the heart of evangelization. Well, I mean, evangelization isn't just kerygma, all the, you know, preaching the kerygma all the way down. In, in some sense, evangelization is a subspecies, it seems to me, of, of didactic teaching. There has to be substance and content. But uh, it's not just catechism thumping either. That mm -hmm. doesn't work. It seems to me, to go with what you just said, uh, I, drawing from my years of experience teaching undergraduates, that the primary role of a teacher of the faith these days is that you have to flip the script. You have to flip the script that's playing in their heads because they're asking all the wrong questions. Yeah, right. And they're br they're bringing to you all the wrong questions. Yeah. And so you you have to teach them to walk before they can run and say no 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 no. You here's what you're really trying to ask, and then not be afraid. And, and I, I say this advisedly, not afraid to be a little cheeky and maybe even a little sarcastic because we've we've got actually sanity on our side. And, and to point out how in many ways uh, liberalism reduces ultimately to a reductio ad absurdum and you can have great effect in, in, in getting them to see that by asking the right questions. Yeah, and it's a complicated matter because it, there's conversion involved there. Uh, what's the yeah. right question? And th there's a primacy to grace. I mean, I would say that's a, a basic biblical principle is the primacy of grace. Grace comes first. God comes first. The gestalt, the revelation comes first. Then we respond to it, of course, and then we, we become conformed to it. The problem is if I'm standing sort of independently outside of revelation and I'm asking now my own questions on my own terms, I'm going to pervert revelation. By that very move, I'm going to draw it into the confines of my consciousness or the confines of my will, is you got to let yourself be changed by what's given in Revelation. I think so, too. I think that's uh, the grace is the grace is the un, un, unobserved element here that you just always have to take into consideration. You can do your best effort and still fail because for some reason, the person that you're the interlocutor is simply not responding to, to the movement of grace. And we well, that's why I, I think holding up the image or the gestalt, or Paul would say, you know, I, I displayed before your eyes Christ crucified. Th there's an opening yeah. move, is, is look at the form, as Balthar would say. And the theologian is maybe going to show you the different aspects and then the integrated beauty of the form. Look at this, oh, and, and yeah. you'll be changed by that, by that move. Okay, you know, I was going to segue right into talking about Vatican II and evangelization, but later on I was going to talk about the form and beauty. But since you bring it up, let's yeah. let's discuss this now because I think it's terribly important. You often say uh, that, you know, evangelization in some ways should lead with beauty, not that it's divorced from goodness and truth and so on, but beauty is really important here. Uh, but by beauty, you don't mean, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, oh, look at that pretty picture over there. Uh, no. be beauty has more this I know exactly so beauty has that deeper sense of gestalt form and Balthazar says for example I mean how and in, in what way is the gestalt of Christ on his cross beautiful yeah so, you know that's a very important point because theologically as you know uh, Luther said there's no theology of glory only a theology of the cross and if you emphasize glory you're you're on a bad path well, Baltar says, I'll give you seven volumes of glory, you know, so the, the hairless kite, I think, was an answer to, to Luther. But also the paradox you point out, that it's actually the cross itself that's not a subcontrario, as Luther would say. You know, it, that is the beauty. Now, how do you understand that? 
Well, Aquinas has the beautiful occurs at the intersection of integritas, consonancia, and claritas. So wholeness, harmony, and radiance. And as I've said, whether that's a golf swing or it's a human face or it's a cathedral, it's a, a beautiful tree, you're noticing integritas, which is wholeness. Consonancia is the harmony of all the elements and parts. Claritas is the shine that comes from the form. It's the, it's the splendor of the form, right? When those come together, we say, ah, that's beautiful. So Jesus, what do you see? And I'll go back to our doctrinal language. In the unity of the one divine person, two natures, human and divine, come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. In other words, in a harmonic relationship. Right. So in the play between the divine and human wills, divine and human mind, divine and human mission, and so on, you see the beauty of Christ. And then look at the, the transfiguration story is the manifestation of the splendor of this uh, harmonic relationship. So the theologian's job on, I think, a Balthazarian reading is to keep illustrating the beauty of the form. Oh, yeah. And I think a mistake a lot of uh, people make when they... Uh, theologians, when they want to maybe know a little about Balthazar, they simply stop after reading volume one of the Aesthetique without really going on to the theodrama, because it, it, as you, you point out, the, the ultimate gestalt, the form and the beauty of it has to do with that interplay, the the marvelous exchange, the right. coming together of humanity and divinity and, and the coming together of their freedoms uh, and the entire drama that is salvation history when taken as a whole is this absolutely beautiful gestalt that stands in contrast with the disintegration yeah. of the world. The ugliness um, of sin, right? Meeting the beauty of Christ and then being drawn into that beautiful form. There's the spiritual life. There's the moral life. Is the reintegration of a disintegrated self. And that looks and feels like something. That's our earlier conversation about the healing that happens in the yeah. presence of the gestalt of, of Christ. Our own beauty is... Um, is reinforced. Absolutely. Now let's, uh, uh, before we get on to Vatican II, I, I would also like to return to evangelization for a second and, and say, okay, so we, we've talked about the sort of uh, doxological aspects of it when the come out of hell aspects of it and all the sin conversion. But there's also a sense in which, um, how shall I put this? I, idolatry has a way of making us slaves to the wrong master, mm -hmm. right? And so it seems to me that one of the advantages to converting people to the faith, is advantages in a, in a salvific sense, is that you're showing them in a sense who the true master is, mm -hmm. who the true king is, and who they should truly serve, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, we're going to serve somebody. I think right. I saw, I think I saw a talk of yours somewhere where you where you, I can't remember where now, where you mentioned this, where you said something, that's why it's in my brain. And I thought, I need to ask him about this because I think it's a brilliant insight. Who do yeah. we serve? Well, you've got to worship something. There's always a sumum bonum. Everyone's got one. Or you've got to follow somebody. You know, you, you have to serve the Lord. And then Bob Dylan, again, it was based on the book of Joshua, was right that finally it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody because if you're not, serving the Lord, then your service is going to be finally under the aegis of, of the dark power. If you're following in that ultimate radical sense, a political leader, uh, someone in your family, someone in the culture, ipso facto, you're in a, in a demonic space there. So it's true. You got to serve someone. Who's your king? Um, go right back to the beginning of the Bible. Adam as king, right? He was the properly ordered king of Eden. And his point, his purpose really, was to go on the march to Edenize the rest of the world. The problem is in sin, he lost the beauty of his life, his integration. He also lost his kingly status, his kingly task. And so he doesn't go effectively on march. He tends to get caved in on himself. Um, watch now the Old Testament. It, so much of it is about the restoration of proper kingship, bringing right. Israel under the right sort of leadership. And then ultimately, this culminates for us in Christ the King. So the right. true King has come. But then the weird thing is he's, um, he's crowned with thorns, and that's where we follow him. Yes. Um, I wrote a blog post not too long ago talking about 
some of these issues. And 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 one of the things I think that people are not aware of is is the extent to which in the in the uh, Old Testament scriptures you you see a tremendous ambivalence on the part, especially in the prophetic tradition, but a tremendous ambivalence among amongst the Israelites towards having a king. Uh, obviously, when Samuel anoints Saul as king, Samuel is initially kind of reluctant to do so, and then sort of God tells Samuel, go ahead and do this, but beware, because I'm going to hold their feet to the fire. Right. And this only goes to show, it's interesting, God says to Samuel, it only goes to show how ungrateful my people are that they now want a king other, other than me. But okay, fine, you can have your king. And then the entire rest of the history in the Old Testament of Jewish kings even their greatest ones is really a story of rise and fall. Right. Uh, and, and so then you, it culminates in the late prophetic tradition, uh, you know, with the expectation of a Messiah because none of the Kings are working out. Right. Uh, yeah. I think what's really interesting there in the biblical tradition is the coming together of these two ideas of the Davidic King, a human figure, a great warrior, and the very clear text about Yahweh himself will come and shepherd his people. I myself will come. Yes. And then they're they're thought together in such a way that you say, well, okay, who is this figure who's both a human Davidic figure and somehow the the true shepherd come to shepherd his people? And then we Christians see that in Jesus, who's announced as David, David, David all the time. Oh yeah. And is also time and again portrayed as the God of Israel himself coming to shepherd his people. So the coming together of divinity and humanity in Jesus is the reconciliation of those two strains of biblical revelation. Oh, I agree. I mean, Joseph Ratzinger, in a, in a great little book, I think it's called Feast of Faith, um, uh, points out, he does this little analysis of the prophet Daniel and his sort of recounting of the various empires of the world that he refers to beasts that rise up from below. Yeah. Uh, and and Ratzinger points out that's why then Daniel starts talking about this figure called the Son of Man. The Son of Man is eventually going to have to come and subdue these beasts in a sense to make the proper reconciliation of what true kingship really is all about. And, and that's why Jesus then identifies himself I am that son of man come to subdue the beasts, uh, but not in a sense to say that there's no such thing as kingship, but to to give us the proper concept of, of kingship. And right. I mean, right. I think this is, go ahead. You no, know, that text is so important. Daniel 7, you know, but you'll see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, uh, who in Daniel mysteriously is both a, a human and divine figure. The fact that Jesus himself cites that at, at the trial, you know, Yes, yeah. you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Is he's using that to interpret his own being and mission? Yes. Uh, okay, so let's move on to Vatican II, uh, because obviously, I think you and I both share the conviction that Vatican II was in very, very much a missionary council. Yeah, uh, a council devoted in its heart and soul to the concept of the re-evangelizing of the world. And yet the re-evangelizing of the world did not happen post-Vatican II. So let's have, a, a, obviously, the causes of that are multifocal and various and contested and so on. What is the Bishop Robert Barron take on what, why, what happened after Vatican II? Well, I, I, to state it generally, bad implementation. I mean, I, I've always held to that. Uh, the texts were not read that carefully, and therefore they were hijacked by uh, cultural forms that were in the air at the time. And so the reading of the signs of the times became a sort of uh, surrender to the environing culture. The church reaching out to the world became uh, the world sets the agenda for the church. Um, so it was like a, a reversion to that correlational thing we we're talking about earlier, is that the yes. questions of the world are setting the tone for the church. And it was that positioning that led to all kinds of trouble. But I remember very well, I mean, I came of age uh, right after the council, and we didn't study the text of the council. There were a couple key ideas, you know, uh, mostly of the liberal sort of variety that were associated with the council, but people didn't read the text themselves. I also hold to what Cardinal George once said, which was in America anyway, the death of Cardinal Meyer was a huge problem. It's, it's very interesting. Meyer, the Archbishop of Chicago at the time, biblical scholar, very prominent player at Vatican II, comes home and announces to the priest of Chicago what the council was about. He wants to start an implementation, and then he died. He was in his yeah. early 60s, I think, when he died. 
and yeah. died very suddenly. I had a brain tumor and died very quickly. And Cardinal George always said that was a huge loss to the American church because the one guy that would know how to read the texts and how to make them uh, happen in this country passed from the scene right away. And so a lot of it got hijacked. And then we had the silly season. You and I grew up with that liturgically. Uh, but there was a silly season theologically and spiritually and lots of other ways. Um, and then it's the Baltazars and company, Ratzingers and Wojtyla's, who kind of righted the ship. I think as they, without abandoning the council, no, they love the council, but they read it much more adequately, I would say. Yes. And well, I, I agree with uh, that analysis. Uh, and I, I would add that any discussions of the sort of collapse of, of Catholic culture and, and the sort of Catholic consensus after the council, uh, which happened almost overnight, has to be explained by antecedent factors. So those who would say, for example, that, you know, the council caused this mess and, you know, we need to go back before it, ignore the fact that there were already huge festering problems, a deep rot already beginning yeah. in the church. Uh, there's that famous article by Joseph Ratzinger where he kind of announced his presence on the scene, 1958. You know, the new paganism in the church, or sometimes translated the new heathenism in the church. And, and so that's already in 58. You can go back to literary figures like Bernanos and Moriac, who are already ringing the alarm bell. Um, yeah, how about Jules France, Saint... France Pays de Mission, you know, is a preconciliar yeah. text. Yeah. France, the, the eldest daughter of the church, is, is mission country. That was a preconciliar perception. Yes. Yeah, why, why did the best and brightest people of that time feel there was a need for something radically, uh, something, something to change? Let's put it that way. Yes. Well, why? Because they, they lived through the preconciliar moment and said great to much of it and not so great to other parts of it. So that's why I'm against the romanticism of, of the preconciliar period that simply looks at all the kind of fine, beautiful features, but overlooks what led people to say even France is a paid de mission? You know, that's an extraordinary claim to make. Yeah. And the idea that liturgical abuses only happened after the council with the introduction right. of the Novus Ordo. Now, I would be the first to say that there was an off the chart in the 70s, especially, period of liturgical experimentation. Yeah. You, you talked about the motorcycle coming up. Yeah, you, I saw it. Priest investments on a motorcycle coming up the middle aisle <laughs> to begin mass. Yeah, yeah, and we all we all lived. You know, you tell people, young people today, what you lived through, and they they roll their eyes. Say, yeah, yeah. No, you have you have no idea. You don't so I'm not trying. I'm not trying to belittle uh, the sort of craziness that that did ensue after the implementation of the Novus Ordo. But it also remains true that there were liturgical abuses with regard to the the old Latin mass. Uh, priests mumbling through the prayers, sure. and barely understanding the Latin, not an unusual at all for a mass, a Sunday mass to last no longer than 25 or 30 minutes. Uh, not every parish had an accomplished Gregorian chant choir. And so, so a lot of times people are comparing their experience right. of the extraordinary form of the liturgy today, which happens in these. And I, and I'm, by the way, I support that. I'm glad that they have the ability to do that. Um, but all their resources are pooled into pulling off this mass properly and beautifully. And then they compare that with maybe a poorly celebrated Novus Ordo right. and they romanticize the past and say, oh, why can't we just go back to this? Um, go on YouTube. You can find it. JFK's uh, funeral mass at St. Matthew's Cathedral, Washington. So 1963. It was Cardinal Cushing was saying the mass. <laughs> and it's the most extraordinary thing. Cushing, who had this grating uh, voice, is at the altar, you know, facing the, the wall. And he's kind of growling, just growling this text in Latin. And then you hear in the background, I guess up in the choir, there's this choir sort of canterwalling. And I think a, a non-Catholic looking at that would say, what in the world is going on here? It's like there's a weird circus happening. And I use that on purpose because people say, oh, the post-conciliar mass is a circus. Well, at times, yeah, it has been. But whatever that was in 1963, yeah. I don't think that's what the, uh, the liturgy is supposed to be either. 
Yeah, and I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for this section we're talking about now. A lot of comments on YouTube oh, well, below. Join and, the you know, club. It, it, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I was just about to say something that you are well aware of exponentially beyond what 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 happens to me. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, we have to speak the truth. And the fact is, I like what you said before. There's a reason why so many great Catholic intellectuals of that period said something has to change yeah. here. There has to be a liturgical reform. There has to be an intellectual reform. Uh, Neo-scholasticism, though good in its own way, is overly objectified and deductive, too extrinsicist uh, in that regard, and it has to be reformed. I'm of the opinion, and I'm sure you are too, that if you look at church history, every era, I mean, there are many eras that you can point to and say that was a kind of high point in the tradition. So you can you can look at the patristic era and say, wow, you know, and that includes Augustine, maybe up yeah. to Maximus. Then you can point to the medieval era and say, wow, look at these guys, Bonaventure, Anselm, Aquinas, look at those leading lights. And then you can point to a few others. But I would argue that that period beginning in the late 19th century and going up maybe till about 1960 or so represents one of those great periods in Catholic intellectual life as well. Um, I, yeah. I, 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 go ahead. No, for sure. There's a, a tremendous ferment going on, in, uh, especially in, in Europe. And these people coming out of these great Dominican and Jesuit traditions where they knew the languages, they knew the, the received tradition, uh, many in dialogue with the uh, contemporary culture in interesting, creative ways. Prior to the Council, I mean, heck, you've got the uh, Thomism in its various forms. So there's Gargou Lagrange, yes, the kind of uber neo-Thomism. But then you've got transcendental Thomism, you've got phenomenological Thomism, You've got whatever, tomes. Yeah. yeah, or Delubach was doing a kind of patristic, you know, synthesis. Uh, but then you've got, uh, you know, uh, the biblical renewal, the liturgical renewal. It was a very uh, fecund time, you know. It wasn't literary, like it was just, a literary. Right, it, right. Go back to like mid 20th century, both sides of the Atlantic. Extraordinary revival of Catholic literary life. Um so there was a lot going on. A lot was cooking at that time. And in many ways, it, it gave rise to Vatican II, Vatican II summing up a lot of what was best in that period. Yeah, my friend Tracy Rowland, who I'm sure you're aware of, yeah. uh, she wrote that great book, Catholic Theology, and it always struck me. Uh, she identifies, I think, I, th I don't want to miss, but I think she identifies 17 different versions of Thomism. Of Thomism, yeah. You know, in in the twentieth, late nineteenth century, the twentieth century, and I think that we need to remind ourselves of that. That the sort of neo scholastic manualist tradition represents only one form of yeah. the Thomistic tradition, and right. uh, and and I think Saint Thomas himself, if I if I may be so bold as to speak for Saint Thomas, I sure I go don't, ahead. I don't think that he would be would have been entirely happy with the reduction of his thought to to the manualist tradition. No, I mean, look, Thomas was a was an extraordinarily open minded fellow. I mean, in dialogue with with the great uh, classical tradition, with the Jewish tradition, with the Islamic tradition, he yes. was listening to everybody around him. He, you probably can still say it in the 13th century that he read every relevant text. In a way, there was something lovely about that, where let's say a theologian could say, I, "I really have read every single text in, let's say, philosophy and." theology and, and Bible that matters to me. I mean, now you can begin to yeah. do that. But uh, no, extraordinarily open-minded uh, person. And then like so many great figures, he kind of gets ossified after he dies and <laughs> becomes a, a kind of intellectual yeah. idol. And that's a problem. I'm a Thomist. I mean, I love Thomas, but don't yeah. turn him into that. He's, um, yeah, he's I, was a, like... I, I call myself a, a, an open Thomist. You know, I, I'm a Thomist, but I, I, I love the you know, variety of perspectives and, and finding points of contact and dialogue. I think Thomas himself was kind of an open Thomist. <laughs> yes, I agree. And, you know, a, a lot of this uh, is just, um, it, it, it's, it's really sort of an attenuation of Thomas in so many ways to, to re reduce him yeah. to, to this sort of calcified version of him in, in, in so many ways. I, you know, uh, to go back to uh, Vatican II then, uh, Vatican II was this missionary evangelizing effort, uh, but it's, it was also an attempt uh, along the lines of what we're discussing here, and it pertains to evangelization. It, it, the attempt, it was an attempt to restore Catholic theology to something broader. So in other words, I think Vatican II, and I think you've noted this elsewhere, was a resource Mont council. And yeah. uh, of the sort of three factions that were vying for control, 
the neo-scholastics and the progressives and then the race horse monk, I, I don't think there's any doubt that at the council and its actual documents that the race horse monk camp won the day. Yeah, I think the texts themselves reflect that. Then, as you know, after the council, the the neo-scholastic thing kind of fell away. And then the battle was engaged between the progressives and the like the adjournamento crowd and the race horse monk crowd, right. to use the cliches. And then with John Paul and Ratzinger and then backed up by someone like Baltazar, I think that that really sort of carried the day. But, you know, when I was going through school, it was very much of an adjournamento Catholicism that held sway and in schools and universities and all that. And it took a long time, the long papacy of John Paul II to sort of consolidate that vision. But it's still, you know, it's still an open question in some ways because people are still fighting and debating. They are. And it does go back, I think, to problems in Christology as well. Would you talk about the, the, the bringing together of, of the human and the divine before? I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Blondell. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Blondell sort of scoped out early on, you know, that you, you really have this problem. And the problem is you've got a sort of extrinsicist and overly objective construal of the nature grace relation therefore of theology and its relationship with reason Mm -hmm. and then you've got overly immanentist factions which is what characterizes essentially modernism Mm -hmm. a lot of people label any modern theologian that they don't like they're modernists but in reality what a modernist was was somebody who had an exaggerated fixation on the immanent aspect of of, and so what blondel was trying to do in l'action was to bring those two things together. And I view that, I have some criticisms of Blondell, as did others, but I view that as the essence of the Resource Mont project, right? The bringing yeah. together of those two things. And therefore, I think it's the essence of Vatican II's project. Yeah, it's de Lubac and it's Balthazar very much, you know. Uh, the debate, let's say, between a Rahner and a de Lubac, the, you know, these two great Jesuit thinkers of the mid 20th century, and that's, they set the tone in a way. Uh, when I was coming of age, Rhinarianism was all the rage and everybody was following Same that. Yeah. And then it shifted, you know, with Balthazar, who, of course, is a colleague of, of de Lubac. Um, that's the story in many ways. It's the battle of those two, those two mid 20th century Jesuits, highly cultivated men, both the super brilliant, but different points of, uh, of departure. Uh, Rahner in sort of a Kantian uh, framework. De Lubac very much in a biblical patristic framework, and that makes all the difference. It does. And there's a sense in which, too, uh, I'll speak now of my Balthazarian hobby horse, that Balthazar is kind of sui generis in some sense. It's just interesting. There was an article in Communio, it was a reprint of something he wrote, where he was going through the history of, of Catholic theology. It might have been the Fathers, the Scholastics, and ourselves, the, the article. But towards the end of it, he identifies himself and he says, I'm, I'm more, I'm not really in the camp of the race source month guys. I'm in the camp of people of converts like Bouye, which I thought, I thought was interesting of him to say. Hmm. Um, and, it, and, I'm and not quite I, sure what he means by that. He's more like, I, I, I I'm not certain. I, 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 he doesn't really explain it in any depth. What I thought was simply interesting was him saying that he, he saw a difference between, I say, a Bouye and a, and a Du Lubac. And I just, I thought maybe you would have some insight into what that meant other than, because I've always been confused by my colleague, Rodney Hauser, always liked to point that out to me. Yeah, uh, no, I must say that's a little puzzling to me. I'm not quite sure what, what that means. Um, no, I don't, I don't either. So let's just drop it because neither one, <laughs> neither of, us one of us knows, knows what we're talking <laughs> about. Neither one of us know what it means. I was hoping that you would have this grand insight into no. it and <laughs> blow me away and, and you don't. So that's fine. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I would I would there go on to say I do think that in some ways Balthazar is kind of sui generis because what he what he tries to do in some ways is to um, I, I think it's often ignored the extent to which he did want to emphasize the objective content of Revelation uh, and he as you know he was very critical of Teilhard de Chardin mm-hmm. and and sort of overly immanentist. Uh, approaches from below in his little polemical work, a moment of Christian witness. He's extremely critical of an overly imminent, this is where he criticizes Rahner's anonymous Christian. Um, so I'm wondering if you had any, uh, I don't want to stump you twice here or, or maybe, uh, but um, I, 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 just, I just really do think that the Balthazarian project, 
the reason why it took off in ways that other resource month projects didn't is because Balthazar does res represent a kind of uber systemization in some ways of all of these strands coming together. Right. No, I, I would say that. I mean, he's the mastermind of the 20th century, I think. You know, Ronner's yeah. a brilliant guy, but Ronner operated out of a very philosophical framework. Um, Balthazar was like everything. Balthazar was Bible. He was the father's knew the medievals. He did know modernity, especially in its literary and artistic expressions. Yeah. Um, he was like, what's De Lubach's famous line, the most cultivated man in Europe. And I think you, you sense that in him. And I think what you're saying is right, that it enables him almost to contain all of these different elements and movements because he was so capacious and so creative in his thinking. Um, I say, yeah. you know, to Ronner's credit, Rahner sent a lot of people to Balthazar. Uh, they came in droves to study with the great Rahner, and he had too many students. So he said, there's this other guy you should really pay attention to. He's just absolutely brilliant. And it was Balthazar. So I give Rahner credit for sending people Balthazar's way. Yeah. You know? And and your employee, uh, Richard DeClue, uh, yeah. you got on my well, – I had him actually – I did an interview with him on on, the, on these blog interviews because uh, he, he says, well, you're being a little hard on Rahner. Uh, I'm always, you know, so anti Ronner. Uh, and uh, so he, he essentially said what you're what you're saying now, which is the, the, obviously we need to be critical of where we think Ronner was wrong. But we also need to acknowledge what a great mind, what a great intellect he was. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure. And there was you know, the Kant project um, going back to Marischal. I mean, that, that's one of the great intellectual projects in the 20th century. Lonergan is part of that. And these are, you know, very serious, important people. So I get that. Uh, and you know, heck I read a lot of Ronner. And so I, I know him fairly well. He's the Catholic Schleiermacher. I often say, but as Tillich is the Protestant Schleiermacher of the 20th century. So Ronner is in that tradition of giving a primacy to experience. I mean, I always see that as a, yeah, you know, man in the presence of absolute mystery is always the starting point for Rahner. Um, it's a Grundkurs des Glaubens rather than a dogmatique, you know. So it's it begins yeah. with the act of faith, if you want, or the experience. So that's the that's the difference. Uh, yeah. As Balthazar Ron said, you know, right, that Rahner went with Kant, I went with Goethe, and Go that made Goethe, all, the, yeah. all the difference. That's a good way to characterize it. I I think so too. Uh, so okay, so we have a few. Just a few minutes left, maybe about 10, 10 minutes left here uh, to discuss. Uh, so let's move on from the Resource Mont thinkers let's, and, and Vatican II and all that. Let's move on to the, the challenges we face today, uh, evangelizing and re-evangelizing the world. Uh, one of the problems that I think that we often have in evangelization is we have audience confusion. Like, who to whom are we really speaking? Because unless you figure that out properly your your message might be off message it may not be right um so when you develop your word on fire materials who is the primary audience that you think is is the primary beneficiaries of what you're doing yeah i always struggle a bit with that question because i, I, I want to say it, it's everybody <laughs> i i want everyone to to listen in and, and benefit probably if i'm more realistic you know it's sort of concentric circles that you are talking to the Catholic world, uh, let's say my sermons um, would very much appeal, I think, to the Catholic population. But I've always been interested in the nuns, right? Especially the young nuns who yeah. are they're outside the faith, they're skeptical, they're rationalistic, they're without religion. So that's always been a, a prime audience of mine. I also love, I just the other day recorded a two-hour thing with uh, Lex Friedman. You know Lex Friedman's uh, yeah. podcast? Yeah. Extraordinary yeah. guy, and he interviews all these people, and we spent two hours talking about everything, you know, God and death and life and meaning. And so I've always loved doing that, too. Um, so I guess it's all of the above. I, I, I don't really think it through that carefully as I'm doing all this work. Uh, but naturally, I think there different audiences uh, will gravitate toward different things that I do. Okay, great, because... You just confirmed one of my own prejudices, which is always good, because when when I was a teacher back in the day, I was a pretty I mean, I'll toot my own horn. I was a pretty effective teacher, uh, but my more pious students uh, were often critical of me. The, the more conservative, super devout Catholic kids were critical of my teaching and accused me often of bending over backwards too much to speak to the nuns. 
all right, yeah. the N-O-N-E-S, right. that I was, but I have to admit, um, and like you, it wasn't an overt and conscious thing in my mind that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm directing what I'm saying to these guys. Um, but I was so deeply concerned with, in a sense, relating the faith to the concerns of the modern world to, in, is this very Balthazar, I mean, this is very Vatican II, very John Paul, launch out into the deep waters, which means right. you, you can't retreat into a fortress. You have to engage the world. And for better or for worse, the world is populated increasingly uh, by these nuts. So when I watch a Word on Fire video or whatever, I'm always struck by how effective I think they would be with the nuns. In fact, I showed your Catholicism series in the latter years of my teaching there in my Intro to Theology courses, and those videos spoke more to the non-religious, indifferent kids than it did to, to yeah. the devout kids. Well, and that might be because of, uh, of beauty. So there I was very much you know, trying to do both truth and beauty, but the beauty yeah. of, of these great places and buildings and works of art, I think will draw anybody in. And then they might want to figure out, what's the world that created that? What are the set of ideas that made that possible? Um, so I'm not totally surprised by that. But I, I've always loved that outreach. And again, we're Baltazarian, Schleifung de Bastionen. You know, it's, you got to yeah. knock down the bastions and get out into the world. Not in that sort of trippy 1960s thing of let's become the world, but it's Noah letting the life out of the ark. You know, go out yeah. now, and it's it's Adam going in the march from Eden to Edenize the world. That's that's the Vatican II vision. Yeah, you know, and yeah, I mean, this does. I mean, I I got criticism for this, and and I don't want to sort of end on on a negative note. But I've seen criticism of, of you, for example, that I go Bishop Barron. You know, he's he's not direct enough, and and you know, he doesn't punch people in the nose with the gospel, and so on. I saw one. YouTube video, somebody making fun of you for playing a Bob Dylan song. By the way, the co-owner of our farm, Father John Gribowich, shout out, Father John, is a huge Dylan. He's a musician. Yeah. He's a huge Dylan fan. Huge. Yeah. So I've had Dylan peppered into me for, for years now. Uh, so I had to laugh when I saw you doing your little Dylan on Dylan's birthday. I think it was yeah. Dylan's birthday. But then right. you you got criticism. I mean, people, does everything have to be controversial? I mean, you got criticism for that. For like, well, what's he doing? You know, kowtowing yeah, to... Yeah, but that's stupid. I, I got overwhelmingly positive uh, that's remarks. That's right. That. Yeah, over 99.8% positive. So now there's always going to be some, you know, goofball on the internet. I'm not going to worry about that. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good because Dylan is one of the greatest poets of our age. Yeah, I think. absolutely. And, uh, and he, he deserves to be championed. So I don't want to end on that on the sort of <laughs> negative note of your, of your YouTube internet critics because they're, they're, they're certainly out there. But it, it points to something that I think is really important in your writings and what you do. And this isn't sort of me curring up to you by false praise or whatever, but you frequently make literary allusions. You talk mm -hmm. about people like Flannery O'Connor, Evelyn yeah. Waugh. Uh, I think your book, Strangest Way, talks you know a lot about them. And you bring in music and so on. But this is what, this is what I'm talking about, engaging the culture. Absolutely, and, and, yeah. yeah you know, and it speaks to the to the heart of the religious nuns, I think. I mean, for example, there's this movie Father Stu. Now, I haven't seen the movie Father Stu. You have. You liked yeah, it, right? I did, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and yet, I, you know, a lot of the people, some people remain nameless where it's got so much vulgar and foul language in it. Like I said, I haven't seen the movie. I'm just assuming, yeah, it probably did have a lot of vulgar. And it was, it had Mel Gibson. So, it, you know, right. it probably had quite a bit. Uh but nevertheless, I can't tell you how many people I know who saw that movie and said it's one of the most moving. Yeah. Uh, I used to tell my students at Mundelein, they would occasionally say, like, you know, Father, you're recommending this movie, but it's got so many, you know, the F word is all through it. And I would say, you know, trust me when I tell you that Jesus heard the Aramaic version of the F word. I don't even know what that would be, but trust <laughs> me, he heard it. Like, you know, we can't live in this weird little pious bubble that, that, uh, doesn't permit us to enter into dialogue with the world. Those are the people we're trying to reach. And there's that great scene, and actually, in Father <clears throat> Stu, because he's got this, you know, very rich and uh, experienced sort of background. And he and he and this other seminarian show up at this prison. And the poor seminarian is just a real bookish, you know, very kind of nerdy guy. And he's trying to engage these prisoners. And he can't begin to do it. And then Stu just kind of, you know, and speaking very bluntly and a little bit profanely. Uh, gets their attention immediately. 
okay, yeah. there's the metaphor, you know, of how do you enter evangelically into the world? Yeah, not to mention the fact that Father Stu in his real life was probably, he probably used a lot of a salty language yeah, uh, sure, by, sure. by all accounts. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to end with this. We're, we're coming towards the end here. I, I don't want to presume your time. Um, but it, it, it does uh, strike me, therefore, to talk about evangelization and the use of beauty, which includes music, the arts, film, so on. Uh, there was a time many centuries ago in which the church was a patron of the arts. Yeah. Could you see that possibly ever happening again in, in, through our universities, perhaps, through direct yeah. support you know, from I, the bishops? How do we do a, how do we go about this? I don't have a good answer. Um, but just the observation that uh, what happened after Trent didn't happen after Vatican II, namely this great renewal of Catholic art. You know, so think of the whole Baroque yeah. uh, explosion. Oh, yeah. But after Vatican II, could you ever say there was a great revival of Catholic art? No, I don't think in any field. If, it, if it's there, it's more accidental, you know. So that's a, I, I, maybe you could say that's a judgment on Vatican II. Uh, that's something that we missed or, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for why that's true. But there wasn't an artistic revival after the council. I think, I think some of it has to do with the fact that, I mean, the laity were more involved uh, in, in some sense. Yeah. And, and um, the universal call to holiness is part of evangelization. And perhaps mm -hmm. the answer is the church just needs to do a better job of raising up artistic types yeah. who are inspired by the faith, you know, yeah. uh, not, not something the church imposes from above, but it bubbles up from below with Catholic artists. Uh, but yet, where are they? That's the question. Yeah. And then like Dana Joya, the, the former poet laureate of California, who was a Catholic writer, asked that question all the time, you know, and muses on, on that problem. I don't think he's got a good answer either, but we all kind of lament the fact that it, it is not, uh, it is not obtaining yeah. today. Well, all right. Well, we're out of time, and I want to thank you for the uh, hour that you gave me. My pleasure, Larry. Thank you. Very busy schedule. You know, it's. I wanted to accentuate the positive and uh, and uh, talk about wonderful things and not get bogged down in intra ecclesial controversies. You know, liturgy and all that. Uh, so, yeah. thank you for that, and uh, God bless and good yeah, luck with, with everything. A word on fire. So good being on. Thank with you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. All thank right. you.